Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, Latin America. Welcome, everybody, to part two of the Listo webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about the international virtual classroom that we have developed uh, with our project. My name is Philip Bauer. I work in the Division for Internationalization at Uppsala University in Sweden. I am the project coordinator of Listo. I will briefly introduce the agenda before I will uh, pass over the word to my colleagues from the Listo project. Uh, just very briefly, in case you don't know, Listo is the Latin American and European Corporation on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It's an Erasmus Plus capacity building project running from 2017 until October 2020. So we're finishing now and we're ready to present the results of our collaboration. We had three focus areas. First one was university industry collaboration. This was last week's webinars topics. Uh, the second one, entrepreneurship education. And the third one, entrepreneurial university. These are our partner universities. We have three from Europe, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Spain. Three from Brazil, two from Uruguay, and two from Argentina. Um, this is the agenda for the 90 minutes webinar that we have now. Uh, we will first give you a very brief overview of the whole International Virtual Classroom that we have developed. And then we will go more into the details of the teacher perspectives and the lessons learned and the best practices that we can share with you. We will then launch a handbook, a publication that we have developed based on our collaboration. We will hear from our students very briefly. And then we will conclude with a panel discussion about what is next in the field of virtual exchange that has become so relevant in the past couple of months. A few of the rules. Um, if you would like to chat amongst yourselves as the attendees, you can do this in the chat function. You're doing that already. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, the Q&A section is for posting questions that we will then direct to the panelists. Me as the moderator, I will gather those questions and I will direct them at the panelists so you cannot speak yourself. And I have a co-host, my colleague Fanny Jonsson, who is with me for technical support. So if you have any questions about how this webinar works, you can message her directly in the message function. And we have social media. We have an Instagram account at Listo Project, and we use the hashtag Listo Project uh, when we tweet or communicate about the project and activities on LinkedIn. So if you want to tweet while you're watching, you can do that with the hashtag Listo Project. Now I will bring on uh, two of my colleagues, and then we will start the first session. Okay, I would like to introduce to you um, Olga Belusova from the University of Groningen and Roberto Guerra from the Federal University of Pernambuco. They will give you the first overview and introduction into the IVC, the Listo IVC. Roberto and Olga, are you with us? I'm here. Can you see me? Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay, yeah, you can start. Great. So good morning, Latin America. Good afternoon, Europe. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak to you today and introduce uh, our ambitious project, International Virtual Classroom to you. My name is indeed Olga Blausova. I'm from the University of Groningen. And what is so ambitious about this project? Just imagine working together across six different countries, 10 universities of all the different scales, private, public, big, small, even bigger, and different uh, faculties, different disciplines. We have come from different courses and experiences in our teaching, and we were more than 30 people of staff involved, co-creating and working together on this international virtual classroom. 
And co-creating means that we had to leverage all of these different backgrounds that we had around the table. And we had to exchange our views, methods, and practices on teaching, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And we also had to align these visions and experiences in order to create something together. So what we developed, we started with developing modules for an interdisciplinary and at the same time intercultural course on entrepreneurship to leverage these backgrounds and to give our students a better perspective on entrepreneurship around the world. So we started with pilots that we developed online in a virtual environment. And of course, we have long-term goals. We have long-term goals to inject these modules in the future uh, existing entrepreneurship programs and to sustain this collaboration beyond the lifetime. And you will see today that we went even further than that. Where did we start? We started asking ourselves, where can we best leverage international and interdisciplinary background of our group? And we focused on three topics, the person, the different customer experiences around the world, the opportunity, how do we make a technology and opportunity in different environments and ecosystems? Are there different ways to network around the world and how to leverage these support ecosystems? This was the pilot for our, uh, this was the basis for our pilots. But before we launched them, there was a lot of learning, learning about our own backgrounds, our own diversities and the diversities in disciplines and backgrounds of our students. Because diversity can be dangerous, but diversity can also be beautiful if you know how to uh, build on a positive aspect. There was a lot of tools that we had to learn for online environment to bring material to students, to collaborate, to build community of almost 200 people involved, 150 students and more than 30 people of staff. And above all that, a lot of skills, a lot of practicing, a lot of calls, a lot of discussions to build our mindset and skill for online teaching. And that's why today we want to share a lot of this learning with you in our reflections and in our uh, best practices about international virtual classroom. It has been a beautiful journey that we started together in 2017. And by no means this journey is ending as you will hear in the talk of Roberto about the IVC 2020 and future plans. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to a great exchange today, both in Q&A and panels, and giving the word to Roberto. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, I'm Professor Roberto Guerra from the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. I'm very glad to join you in this meeting, especially because we are talking about the greatest experience of this project uh, on my behalf, the IVC uh, 2020, our, our uh, experience in entrepreneurial solutions, innovative global networks. So uh, following Olga's speech, I'm trying to introduce you uh, the bullet points of our project. Our trajectory started in the Groningen meeting in the Netherlands, where, when and where the three pilots were uh, designed and named. The teams worked virtually and uh, three, four months later in Cordoba, Argentina, we validated the proposals and we started to work deeply in each pilot. We run the pilot uh, during the beginning of 2019 and in Sao Paulo, Brazil, we validated the results, we discussed it and we presented what we achieved and we didn't stop. We tried to go further and we proposed the IVC 2020 that in Valladolid, Spain, we validated and created the roadmap. So, as Olga told you, we had three pilots um, run 
from March to April until April in 2019. And during September and October 20, uh, 2000, 2019, we developed three task forces for the IVC 2020 concerned with logistics, technological issues, the audience, the students and teachers, and the content. Well, for the IVC, we developed an identity, uh, a brand. Uh, we used the list of uh, inspiration to create that. We had one syllables, um, the bigger image in the middle of the presentation with all the information about our course. We developed uh, images for social networks. We were ready, we were excited, but we were hit by the COVID-19, as you uh, know. So we had to make a few changes and from the same presential, we went 100% virtual during 2020. And I'd like to th say thank you to one designer student from UFP, Ikaru Soriano, who helped us with all the design tasks from the IVC. Well, what was our purpose? We want to develop the students' skills in innovation and entrepreneurship with an international background. We did it using the multidisciplinary and multicultural uh, competences and soft skills to put them together in online and uh, in a teaching and learning online environment. And our focus was the UN SDG. So the students tried to think uh, in terms of innovation concerned with the social and sustainability issues that are uh, put out, putting everybody here in a very tough uh, situation, since we have to deal with very uh, tough problems all around the world. Well, in terms of calendar, our classes began on March and we had classes until May. There were uh, uh, eight classes with two weeks break in the middle two hours of synchronous classes and teaching, uh, sharing classes. It was a very excited experience in terms of how we did it. Well, we have combined lectures, workshops. We used popular methodologies. We used real life cases. We had uh, a pre-activity conducted by Professor Wendy Caharo, who will speak later this morning. And uh, we use the design thinking methodology as our principle and uh, focus during the application of entrepreneurial methodology. We had 11 teachers and 12 mentors. Those 12 mentors were guiding 15 groups. And at the end of the IVC, we had a competition among the groups and we have six groups startups being awarded in, in two different categories, the best project and the best innovation. So thank you very much and hope to see you later this morning. Okay, uh, thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Olga, for this brief overview. We will now dive right into the teaching experience and I will bring on as panelists uh, three of our teachers. They are Florencia Clemente from Universidad Católica del Uruguay. Uh, Leticia Arcusin from Universidad Nacional del Litoral in Argentina, and Wendy Gerard Carraro from Universidad Federal Rio Grande do Sul in, in Brazil. So give me a moment to bring them on, and then they will present the perspective of the teachers. Hi. Okay, you're ready to go. Okay, Neti. Hi. Yes, yes. Okay, now. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you very much. Good morning, Latin America, and good afternoon, Europe. 
Thank you for attending our, our webinar today. I'm Leticia Alcusin from Universidad Nacional Litoral in Argentina. And together with Florencia from Universidad Católica del Uruguay and Wendy from Universidad Federal de Rio Grande del Sur in Brazil, we want to share with all of you our experience of entering the world of virtual teaching and learning. And okay, let's start our presentation. For some of us, designing a course can be easy. For others, it may be a more difficult, but I think that designing a virtual course has its particular characteristic. For Listo team, this was a great challenge. We had to make a lot of decisions at different times. We had to agree on the characteristics of the courses between people from uh, six different countries and 10 different uh, universities, as Olga said previously. It was a great challenge. And let's remember that it was not only a virtual teaching, it was a multicultural, multidisciplinary, and international experience. In this slide, we want to, to share our experience and we want to highlight four important steps. First of all, the preparation, our experience with CARS preparation. Second, the experience with the call and student selection. In third place, the experience related with the execution. And finally, our experience with evaluations. Let's start with the first point, the preparation. One of the first challenges we had to define, we, we was, um, we had, sorry, was defining the content and the schedule of the courses. Our recommendation, do it months before the course starts. In our case, the content was designed, take it advantage of the strengths of, of the team members, considering good teaching practice, as Olga and Roberto said previously too, choosing the content, in those um, that each teacher was stronger. Um, for the schedule, we had to take into account important things. The calendars of all the universities are different. Although it, it seems simple, it's not so easy to consider or to coordinate holidays, exam weeks, and other classics, for example, between all the universities. Other important thing is that the course had to be attractive to students. This is the second point. In our case, the challenge was to choose content that could be attractive to students for different countries, six, six different countries, and with different cultures too. The third point, the third important point, is the um, designing of the syllabus. We did it together, all the teachers together, and we decided to include international, intercultural, and global dimensions. Another important thing related to the syllabus is to consider the credit system of each university. For example, universe, European universities consider both classroom hours and work hours at home, while Latin American universities usually consider only class out, classroom hours. So it is a important point too. And finally, it's important to pay attention to the bibliography and class material. In our case, we prefer to use specific bibliography and complement it with another books or papers or something like that, and other materials and links. And we decided that the students can read according to their interest, uh, the, the, the paper that they choose. Now, Flo will share with, with us the experience of the call and selection of students. Thank you. Hi. Um, I don't know if you are seeing me here. Okay. Well, so the second part after the um, the, the stages that Letty discussed is related to the call and selection process. And we started with the call, the call and promotion. Here, one of the main aspects that we found is that we have to be active and promote with clear information, the requirements, the environment, the evaluation, all the information that we have and can share with the students. And this is a very important point in order to prevent dropouts during the course. 
use the, we use different channels. Uh, obviously, we use email. We use the, the people in the university that already know the students, previous teachers. And um, this was to, uh, in order to, to be able to share with the students the information. And after that, uh, we, we went to a second step that is registration and support. During the registration process, we find that it's better to have just one website or one, um, one space as the same registration for all the different universities. And this gives us the sense of unity. In the registration website that I'm going to show you now, uh, the students can find all the information from the course and also a contact person for each university. And this person is responsible uh, for the communication with the students during the registration and selection process. So it's, it's very important for us that the website that you are seeing now, it has, as you can see, the information about the course, the format, the duration of the course, participants, this is, this is also very important, the specific learning goals. And we also have here, this, this first video is an invitation from the professors that, are, that were going to teach the course. And also on this side, we have some testimonials from students that have already taken the course. And finally, what you can find here, and this was the, the, the thing that we learned that was um, better to have on the website, and it's very, very important, it's to have the contact person for each university. Well, continuing with the presentation, the next step is student selection. And after the registration period, each university received the information about the candidates and the selection was made locally. This was something that we learned after the first pilot because the huge difference between our universities in terms of quantity of students, quantity of applications, resources, requirements, and so on. As an example, in my university, Universidad Católica, we had 30 applications. So we were able to go through each student and, and we evaluate the grades. We talk with different professors that knew the students before in order for them to give us recommendations. And we consider a lot of information from each student. And, that, and we were able to do that because we have 30 applications. But in the cases and our universities that have uh, around 200 applications because they are um, a bigger university, um, the, the selection process cannot be made by the same way. And finally, the group formation. This is the last step for the call and selection stage. And it's with the selected students from each university that we created the groups. Our main goal here was forming the groups with diversity. Each group should have one student from each country. They should be gender balanced. And if possible, they should have students from different majors so they can create a better solution to the challenge that we are going to work during the course. Now I'm passing to Wendy. Wendy, you are mute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now it's okay. Are you listening? It's okay. Good, yes, good morning. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Wendy Carraro from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the execution. Um, um, process. So the execution path of our courses, our two courses, included a very important process of communication between students and between teachers and mentors. So we used uh, different technological 
tools to stay close and collaborative. So how uh, my colleague said, uh, so since the course was conceived, we teachers have been connected through WhatsApp and Google Drive building our syllabus. Uh, Roberto will, will go on to speak a little more about the syllabus, which was our guide in both courses. In the first edition of the course, we used the Moodle platform, and in the second edition, we used the Google Classroom. This space are essential for students' deliveries to occur in a standardized way. It was very important to have these platforms uh, to give the documents and to receive the, the deliveries from the students. One of the most exciting parts was, uh, of the courses was the synchronous classes, when in addition to content and guidance, teams were challenged to develop part of their projects. For this, we used uh, different technological tools to allow it the monitoring uh, of the development, of this development. Mural, Padlet, Mentimeter were, are some examples of the tools that we use it. I sent in the comments now in the webinar, a link uh, from a Padlet. Do you have an, uh, an example? Uh, that Padlet have the information about our university, but you can do a lot of things with Padlets. And um, the form of organization of each teams was peculiar. peculiar. Uh, they organized themselves for the group meetings using tools that would allow the construction of the project in an effective way. The communication and transmission of our synchronous classes involved the use of several technology technologies. In the first course, we use the Blue Jeans, Polycom, and in the second, IVC, we use it the Zoom like this that we are using now, and uh, of course, a lot of WhatsApp. I'm going to show you uh, very quickly how the way that work at the groups with the WhatsApp. The initial idea was for the meetings to be local with the students from the same university, but to carry out the activities on their cell, phone, or computer with their teammates who were from our other university. With the pandem pandemic, we ended up not performing in this format, but uh, the first meetings that were proposed proved to be quite interesting. The student's evaluation process was mainly due to their participation throughout the development of the uh, development of the project and the presentation of the final pitch. On this occasion, all part participants, students and teachers were able to participate to evaluate both of the idea and the pitch. Um, uh, Flo, you can pass to the second, the next slide, please. We also carry out surveys with students and teachers at the, in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end of the course, in order to identify points to be improved and to be and to follow the process of developing uh, competence and skills in all involved. So for me, this was one of the best experiences I ever had as a teacher to be able to share and to be involved in an in international entrepreneurship teaching process, uni, uniting continents, countries, cities, nationalities. It was, we really need to make this world better. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to meet all of my fellow teachers, students, and especially to make a difference in everyone's life. You did in mine. So thank you. I have a minute to share my screen and to show the... Um, I can share my screen, Philip, quickly. Um, I think we should also take some questions. We have received a few questions and maybe the three of you could oh, okay. respond to them. We have um, just one, one, yes. just one slide more. Philip, okay, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Okay. okay, so three tips that these are the main things that we, we've um, learned through the process. Uh, first one, uh, having hundreds of students working in 15 groups requires plenty of work and it's a great challenge to manage the communication. So no message can be left unanswered and no student can feel alone or excluded from the group. So the first tip is be prepared for extreme support and intense, intense communication. 
Tip number two is in order to have a great experience during the course, it's useful to have on campus meetings and in addition to the virtual mandatory classes. So it's very important to set the environment for the students to be able to communicate in the class and also uh, work with their group mates from different countries. And finally, and this is related to the, the thing uh, Wendy was saying, in my opinion, the most important tip that I, uh, we can give you as, as the team of professors is regarding the team. I am honored to be part of this group of professors that make possible this amazing experience of deep collaboration. So just a big thank you to the team and especially to you, Philip, and to Uppsala University that made this possible. So now, yes, if we, you have any questions, we will gladly answer them. Thank you for your presentation. So we have received uh, two questions that are about accreditation tests. So how do students get credits for participating in the IVC? And how did you as the teachers check the students' knowledge? So I guess the question is, how did you test them? Okay. For the second question. Maybe Wendy, that she talked about the evaluation. Yes, I think on the previous evaluation, we asked for, um, we asked the student for a CV and we did an um, interview with them in some universities, a, in an individual interview or, or a group, group interview. But that depends on each, each university because as Flor said previously, some universities receive uh, something like 13 uh, applicants and or applications and others more than 200. So it depends on, on each university. Okay, and regarding credits, how did we deal with uh, credits for the participation in the course? So uh, that depends so, on the university too. On, yes. Yes, depends on the university. For example, in my university, they received a certificate and uh, they have the hours of this one. So uh, in each course, for example, if uh, is a, um, a students are studying in a, in, a, in a course, a graduation course now, so they need to, to open a process of to have the credit. So they are, go they, they are going to, to present the certificate and this is going to be in the, in the, in the process. So depends of the university, of the course, of the intent of the students. So the certificates, with the certificates, they, they can do, uh, they can have the credits in their courses. And what I can say for the case of the Swedish participants, they all came from a master program and they came from sort of an open module. And with that participation, they could get credits for within their master program. So basically we have a flexible solution, but no universal accreditation. I mean, this is something that we've been thinking about and it's something for the future, but that is not so easy to pull off. I think we will come back to that later. Another question was whether we would consider expanding to other universities. The next session will address that. Um, and maybe one more question. Uh, we are not finished with, with the whole presentation. Uh, the first question was, what was more difficult or easier than you expected? I would say the, the most difficult part was uh, this year that the situation changed so, so um, unexpectedly. Uh, keeping the students like um, committed to the course, not losing the students during the COVID situation. Uh, maybe Roberto, uh, um, I don't know if um, you have the numbers to share the, about how many students they started and they finished the course. We have some dropouts. That was a, the most difficult challenge, I think. Okay, good, thanks. I see more questions, but I think they can be answered by the next session. So I suggest that we move on and we will come back to that. Uh, thank you very much, okay. Leticia, okay. Wendy, thank you and Clemencia, and we will introduce the new panelists now. Thank you. One more. Goodbye. Okay, uh, we have three new teachers who are going to present the next part 
about uh, the work done and the results that we can uh, show from the IVC. I would like to introduce Andrei Lemefroy from the University of Sao Paulo, Juan Safe from Universidad Nacional de Córdoba in Argentina, and Hubert Guerra, you know already, he's from the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. So the virtual floor is yours. Great, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Philip, you blocked my camera and I can't open it from here. Okay, let's okay. see. <laughs> Thank you. It's working now. So, good morning again, uh, and Latin, Latin American, and good afternoon, Europe. I'm glad to be back here with my partners, coordinators of the IBC 2020, Andre and Juan, to talk about a more detailed aspect about the IBC with what we've done and the results we obtained about the best practice in teaching entrepreneurship. Our agenda will be um, organized in terms of execution, the evaluation, team and preparations, tough things and plans for the future. And you see three different speakers about uh, talking about the different aspects about, uh, from the IBC. So about the execution, we had around 100 students. As Florencia told you a few minutes ago, we started with more than 100, but regarding the COVID epidemic, we had some dropouts because uh, some of them met some difficulties to access internet with a good quality to follow the classes or regarding some for, uh, family issues or particular problems and at the end of the process, we finished with uh, almost 98 students. So 100 was our, the, media, um, the average number of participants. The 15 groups were worked very well. Some of them were mentored uh, by one or two teachers. And this work was very hard because we had a lot of messages and a lot of support to give the students. So we use a lot of WhatsApp GIFs to encourage them to don't don't eat and go ahead. Two same presential classes at the beginning and we were hit by the pandemic. And then the six online classes, as Florencia told you, we use a combined method about synchronous and asynchronous work. Uh, we had 16 hours of synchronous classes and 14 hours of asynchronous classes. As I told you before, this morning we had six awards regarding the best projects and best innovation because we split the 15 groups in three different breakout rooms where the five groups presented their final pitches and we evaluated them. Uh, as a result and in fact of the project, we had uh, one student from the Federal University of Pernambuco, uh, participant from the S Bricks uh, group, a group that developed a brick uh, produced after recycled plastic. She had a meeting with a local member of our mayor to discuss how they can use this kind of technology to improve social buildings and social projects in Recife, a city in the northeast of Brazil. So regarding the course, we have a project-based learning among the students and teachers, uh, UNSDG-oriented. This is a, a commitment uh, that the IVC has to talk about innovation entrepreneurship with this uh, background. We use it popular agile methodologies like the scrums and thinking roadmaps in different situations with different teachers. We were focused on solve real and painful life problems. So the students came up with problems regarding trash, energy, water, uh, recycling. So they were focused on solve problems uh, very close to their daily lives and with social problems and issues from different countries. And for that reason, students uh, shared common issues and it was a very good experience to see even in different countries and if with different backgrounds, they were concerned about some global issues that need to be uh, solved as soon as possible. 
In terms of students, uh, we had a, a concern about the gender balance with the multidisciplinarity and multiculturality. We respected a lot of different issues regarding that, and we didn't face any kind of trouble about that. We never have a meet uh, face to face because we have students from different countries inside the same group, even uh, when they were together locally in the two uh, first classes, they were just the common university students, but they didn't uh, join the same group. So the group were formed, were composed by different students from different countries that never made meet, meet face to face. Uh, we had to build a confidence among the members and with the among the members and the mentors and it's hard to do 100% virtually and with a very fast schedule. Uh, we had to share the context about the ideas, about the painful issues. We had to show them that the sustainability questions is a common uh, issue for everybody. And we use it an international framework to discuss uh, and talk to them about entrepreneurship and innovation because this course has this kind of challenge to talk about theory and practice into an international framework. So one of the most beautiful things to see was the empathy among the members and among the teachers. So all the groups uh, worked very well together. And we had some issues to be pointed here like the participation, engagement, the personal effort, expectations, and motivation. So we were dealing with 100 students with different interests and different levels of motivation. So it wasn't a dream at all, um, but we have um, very a, a very good experience more than problems. In terms of evaluation, I'm presenting you some of the uh, results from the final evaluation uh, where only 37 students answered the form. So it's not a, a massive number of uh, answers, but you can see uh, that we had a very good result of them saying that they must, uh, they were very satisfied, satisfied with the course. And if you can see in the Low bar is the one about the strongly agree, and in most of the aspects of the IVC, from the syllables in the beginning and the final pitch at the end, they were very confident about what we have done. So, uh, we have here some issues in blue, like strongly disagree in terms of tasks, mentoring, technologies, but it wasn't a very uh, a huge number. So, I think they we made a great work. And the most important thing for us is that they can spread the news about a new edition among the friends and partners. And you can see here the biggest bar is that most of them wants to help us communicating uh, the further experiences, the new one IVCs. So one. Please, Philip, uh, give me some camera. Hey, thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. My name is Juan, I'm from Cordoba. Good morning, Latin America. Good afternoon, Europe. And good night, Asia, if we have some people there. Um, well, as Wendy just talked about this, we use technological resources. I highlighted some of them in order to provide you with some tips or experience. For example, all our classes were through Zoom, like this webinar, but in the first year, in the pilot year, we let our students communicate among them in whichever way they, they wanted. Uh, for the second year, we made them to have a mandatory WhatsApp group with the mentors because we learned that we should be following them more closely. During classes, we used lots of collaborative tools. I just highlighted two of them. For example, Mural. Mural is a great tool if you have a, a, a class with many students to work together in the same panel. And Mentimeter is a very good tool to. 
and collect the opinions or the impressions of the students during classes. And also, as Wendy just has just said, we, we changed uh, the virtual classroom platform from Moodle to Google Classroom to the, during the second year because I, we thought that it was more easy to, to use. And next um, slide, please. And this is what, what, this is the most important thing I wanted to say. The key resource in this project is the team. And for a team like the one we had to work, you need to have a lot of soft skills. You need to build confidence. I think the, the our team, we had great, 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 we have made great friendship among us. Uh, we are a very good team. We didn't know each other before and we managed to work together very well because we had soft skills. We communicated very well and very much among, with each other. We collaborated a lot, a lot, and we tried to, to be creative on what we've done. I think that what Olga said at the beginning and, and, and the rest of the team is saying until now is completely true. The, the team is what makes the difference. And you, if you want to develop a course like this, pay attention to the team. The two animations that I have, the two animations that I have there are maybe illustrate some of the key features of a team like that. You see a, a Formula One car there. I wanted to highlight two features of our team. First, everyone is, is prepared for when the car arrives. Everyone knows what to do. They have talked of it before. They have very aligned uh, tasks. And when, they, when the car comes, they work together to change the tires, for example. So preparation and collaborative problem solving is a key. And in the second animation, the, the one of the, of the right and down, it's a cycling metaphor. When you are in a bunch of cyclists, the rider that is in front, it's taking the win, so it's making more effort than the rest of them. In a long run uh, project like ours, uh, with three years of work and with many different universities, calendars, responsibilities that each professor has locally, different courses and so on, different time zones and so on, you need to be prepared to have a rotating leadership. When one, when one of, the, of the team is tired, another one has to take its role. We have, you have always, you always need to have a fresh horse or a fresh rider to lead the pack. And it doesn't need to be the same person all the time, especially in bigger groups like the one we had. So this was an amazing feature of our team. We all started following one leadership, then we moved and it was so smooth. Nobody really noticed that this was happened. Now we, we look back and see that. Uh, please, the next slide. Uh, well, but we have some problems. We do. The world is not perfect, nor do, nor, we are, we are perfect. The pandemic hit, hit us very hard. Uh, we have uh, some preparation for local classes and we have to move them to, to be uh, completely virtual. And especially students as well as teachers had different personal problems. For example, we here in Argentina had a student that she was married with a doctor that was working 24 seven in the beginning of the pandemic. So she had to leave the course because nobody would take care of their, of their kids. Um, but we managed to do that. And also fostering collaboration among students in an international setting is not easy. 
I think that this topic has been sufficiently covered now, but uh, it has some practical problems. Don't underestimate the practical problems, the time zones, the different uh, commitments they have with the with the or with the rest of the courses they are taking. We, for example, in Argentina, in March or April, is like more relaxed time of the year for students. And I think in Europe, the the pressure is the, the pressure is building up at this point of the year. So we you need to take care of these things. And we have I I think we have an opportunity for improvement. That is, we need to be we to follow up to be more uh, more more near the students to follow up the projects they develop. But the thing I want to highlight again, it, I, you cannot overestimate how important building a good team of teachers uh, is. I want to thank Philippe for leading the way for this, but it's more like a collective, uh, collective achievement that we work so well together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, please, Andre, continue. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon for Latin America. Uh, good morning. Uh, sorry, good afternoon for Europe. Good morning for Latin America. Good night for Asia. Very pleased to be here. So I will talk about some of the obtained results, uh, final obtained results, and some of the perspectives for our future initiatives. So we started to research about, about our academic contributions. So this is a key uh, a network of keywords about international virtual classrooms. So this is how the, the academia uh, is uh, researching these themes. Please, next. Uh, and we can find that we somehow we are contributing for development of knowledge in three main aspects. First, about human capital development. So we are uh, contributing with our students to form them uh, as future entrepreneurs. Next, we are improving technology-based education. Uh, we had some discussions about these issues previously. And third, please, back, <laughs> we are also, uh, we are also, sorry, uh, having some improvements concerning student-centered learning. About the findings and objectives for the future first. Uh, the first uh, is quite obvious, but entrepreneurship education is amazing because it promotes the development and diffusion of innovations, creation of new startups, creation of jobs, etc. So one key aspect for us is the idea that we must foster the creation, development and connection and improvement of all kinds of entrepreneurial education. Next, please. Second aspect, the idea that we now at universities have some new output uh, of knowledge, not papers, not education, but the spin-offs and startups are also a very good result that can be obtained in this kind of a situation. So stimulating the creation of spin-offs and startups or uh, at universities is a very important and honorable, honorable objective. The next one, please. Third, a very important aspect that we are learning, social entrepreneurship adapts traditional entrepreneurship with social objectives, providing new uh, benefits. So the idea of improving and stimulating the formation of social entrepreneurs is very important, very relevant, especially when we think about Latin America uh, and for the next 10, 20, 30 years, this must be a sincere objective for us. Next one, please. Concerning the future, the IVC was really amazing. So the both 2019, 2020, and after the course, we had several peer-to-peer -peer connection. So one important aspect about that is that our network exists, exists because of the connections. When the connections are alive, we'll be uh, alive as a network. Next, net, next, please. So this is our current network, therefore 10 university from 10 universities from six countries. Next, please. And our future objectives. We, uh, we want to keep the, 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 the network alive, so we must promote the creation and the improvement of networks inside universities connecting all the courses. 
local uh, connections. For example, at São Paulo, we have now a, a, a network of uh, entrepreneurial universities. At the national, national level, continental level, and global level, we must somehow improve this kind of network. Next, next please. And for this, for 2021, our main challenges, we want to make it again, we will make it again. So we must check uh, the interest of our initial partners, of the 10 partners. Next, we want to bring uh, and to engage new partners in this initiative. Therefore, we want to open our network for new connections and for new uh, context. Uh, two important challenges for this, we must find institutional support. All the universities are based on soft connections. Therefore, the institutional support is quite important now. And another point that has been already mentioned, the idea of the curricularization of this in initiative, since uh, for us and in our reviews, this is the best uh, entrepreneurship initiative that we are have in our universities. Next, please. So final words, we are now planning 2021 and be very welcome. Uh, new universities and the, the initial partners. Uh, we are now planning and initiating the roadmap. So we welcome everybody and let's start to make it uh, happen in 2021. Thank you very much. This was, these were my words. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Andre, Juan and Roberto. We've received quite a few questions, 11 of them. I think some of them are very broad maybe they have been asked already, some are very particular. So I would say for the very specific questions, I would refer you to the LISTO website, listoproject.eu listo in the section IVC 2020, we have a list of all the contact teachers from each partner university. So if you have a very specific question, then you can, can contact them directly. I will raise a few of the, of the bigger questions, the, the overarching questions. So one of them is concerned, how did we deal with language barriers? So the official language was English. None of us was a native speaker. How did we uh, overcome language barriers? Um, can I answer, Philip? We tested our students for their level of English before joining the course. Uh, it was like, a pre, uh, like mandatory um, to have a good level of English. So every student in the course uh, could communicate with each other and could follow up the, the classes. And this worked very well. Using English, it worked, worked very well. Okay, then we have a question from Saki Yeager from Groningen. How was intercultural competence integrated? Did they, so I guess the students, did they reflect on intercultural competence development or the teachers? So the role, the topic was entrepreneurship, but what role was intercultural communication? Yes, for that, for that issue, you had a pre-activity uh, that worked very well to present the students to themselves, to openly talked about where they came from, what they know, um, and we didn't have any kind of big issue regarding cultural differences. Uh, maybe regarding uh, how the students work, it, like how many hours they, they put to the project and uh, where they went in a day, they work it for the classes and for the activities. And some of them would try to work in the, after midnight, some of them would try to work in the morning, so this is a, the kind of problem we had, but not big issues regarding cultural differences. Okay, Sarah is asking, what lessons did you learn from the pilots that informed choices and changes you made for the first real implementation? So the 2020 edition. Well, that's a very, very long question to answer. We learned a lot. We learned some things technology-wise. We learned, we, an important thing that we learned from the pilot that we should integrate all the subjects in one course. That's what we did. Another thing that we learned that it's that we needed a longer, a longer course. And then I think Andre was going to answer some things. I don't want to, to finish up. But we learned a lot. We learned things to uh, for the selection process, for the dissemination process. We learned a lot. I don't know who, has, who asked the question. Sara, you can reach out to us if you want more detail because that's a long 
long, long answer that we can provide you. Okay, and we will take one more question from Panuvan. I think I recognize him from one of our um, Asia project. The question is, in the international virtual classroom, student groups are mixed between universities. If so, how do you build trust for them to work together as a team? Uh, I would like to answer this question. Uh, this is a very important part. Uh, we were pioneers in 2019 when we combined the students, one student from each university, so, and we said, please uh, find you using WhatsApp. So WhatsApp was very important for the students to connect and to start working together in 2019. And what happened is that uh, after that in 2020, almost all new uh, initiatives at universities because of the COVID are being uh, deployed in this way. Therefore, somehow students now have to meet each other and to connect and to have some kind of friendship using WhatsApp. So what, WhatsApp was amazing. We tried to combine the most uh, diverse profile of students and uh, somehow they could manage. But as one told before, we had several issues. It's not easy. Uh, some students dropped out, some students entered in the middle of the process, but this was a really amazing uh, process. And I think that a uh, very important topic for future research, how can we start virtual uh, teams of students that have not met and will not met. So this is a virtual connection and a virtual experience. Okay, thank you to three of you. Um, there are more questions. And of course we have a lot more answers that we don't have time today, but we have together as a team developed a teacher handbook, which we're officially launching today uh, with this webinar. I will now bring on my colleague, Ulrika Persson Fischer from Uppsala University and she will briefly present um, the book to you. Okay, Ulrika, yes. you can go. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Ulrika Persson Fischer from Uppsala University. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here and nice to see so many of you. As so many of my colleagues now have been uh, talking about, we did a lot of work in this project, in this international virtual classroom. We encountered many problems, many challenges, we solved them, we learned so much, we have so many experiences. And we think that what we have learned is quite valuable and could be useful for others. So we didn't want all this to go to waste. So therefore we made this handbook uh, for uh, the uh, entrepreneurial virtual classroom. And we are happy to, to launch it here. Uh, it is intended to help others who are in similar uh, processes. So uh, this is the content uh, of, of the handbook. First, uh, we explain the international virtual classroom in the context of entrepreneurship education. Uh, and uh, we, dis we discuss the course content and reflections and inspirations as practical advice and conclusions and plans for the future. It is quite um, easy to read and easy to navigate and you can go to the pieces that is most relevant and useful for you. There is a lot of um, uh, inspiration uh, in terms of quotations from students who took the course and from teachers who uh, was teaching and instructing the course. So it is e easy to use. But who should read it and why? Well, we were many universities here involved in this who were already doing a lot of entrepreneurship education. And what we did here was to build on all the experience that we already had in terms of entrepreneurship education and took this a step further. So what we present here is in a sense, a kind of global cutting edge in terms of entrepreneurial edu uh, entrepreneurship education. So anyone who is interested in entrepreneurship education will uh, find interesting stuff in this book. It's an international virtual classroom, meaning that we, uh, we discuss here a lot about the international aspect of it, the intercultural aspect of it. So anyone who is interested in 
international and intercultural education will also find lots of interesting stuff. And of course, also not least in relation to these international and intercultural dimensions, a lot about group processes, dealing with uncertainty, problem solving, soft skills and sustainability. So there's a lot in this book for many different kinds of audiences. And since it is about a virtual classroom, it is about how we attempted to create a, an international experience when you cannot really meet one another. That is students in different countries all over the world, in two different continents, whom we want to give an experience of working together in international teams, although they didn't really meet. Now, maybe that sounds familiar to anyone in these Corona times. I mean, we were developing this course. We didn't really then know how timely our knowledge and experience would be. But what we really do here is to, to discuss pedagogy and the use of electronic technology to create high quality education in situations where you cannot meet. So anyone, meaning I think all of us who is now trying to deal with this kind of educational settings where you have to have good quality interaction while you cannot meet physically, you will find interesting stuff here. So this book is intended for teachers who themselves maybe want to do this kind of uh, international virtual classrooms, but it's also very handy for other project managers of, for example, Erasmus projects or other projects working with large group of, of people and universities. But also it's very important also for the strategic level of universities. It's about internationalization. It's about pedagogical development. So also those working in those functions uh, will also find lots of important stuff in here. As you can see, it is, uh, it is um, available in different languages. So not only English, we have three different versions. So everyone, uh, we are happy to share with you all our experiences in this handbook. Thank you. Thank you, Erika. So if you go to our website, listoproject.e, in the section resources, you will find so far the English one, the Spanish and the Portuguese will follow in the next couple of days, but the English one you can download already and it's, it's for free. It doesn't cost you any money. Thank you, Erika. We've heard from a lot of teachers now, and we've ignored, of course, another very important group, and that is the group of the students. So we have a short video that uh, I would like uh, to play for you with some short reflections and inputs from the students who participated in our IVC. Hello, my name is Martin. I'm studying business administration in Universidad Nacional de Córdoba, Argentina. Hi everyone, my name is Matias Mansur and I'm studying business management at Universidad Nacional del Litoral in Santa Fe, Argentina. Hello, my name is Mariana and I study chemical engineering at the University of South of Brazil. My name is Lautaro Vogt and I studied chemistry in the Universidad Nacional del Litoral, Argentina. For me, Listo Project is an enjoyable experience where you can learn a lot from many people, such as culture, how to fix some problems, different point of view. I recommend it to do it and to enjoy it. What I really enjoyed about uh, Listo was the opportunity to learn and to work with people from different parts of the world. Listo allowed me to perceive and notice that there are very similar interests and very similar problems between people from different countries. The one thing I most enjoy about Visto was having the possibility of working and learning with people from different cultures and countries. Something that I learned in this talk was how to develop ideas that might help solve different issues and problems in the world. 
I learned to work with people from other countries, which allowed me to practice my English and also I could use my knowledge to try to fix some environmental problems. The LISTO project was a very interesting course where I could learn uh, how to work with different people from different countries in a very dynamic way. The best thing I could take from this course was learning the way from picking a problem to getting to a solution and then applying it to the market. Listo! 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 Okay, bye! Very well. <laughs>
has to necessarily reach the level of um, the bureaucracy that you have to go through to set up joint degrees, for example. But I think having MOUs, memorandums of understanding between universities um, and making sure that, um, and I don't know in this network of 10 universities, how much buy-in there is um, at the higher levels of um, you know, the decision-making processes. So um, the rectors, the deans, that sort of thing. But I think getting um, solid um, uh, support from international offices, from various deans, and not just from teachers and people who are really enthusiastic about it, um, that's really important, uh, I think, in moving things forward. Because uh, I heard all of that enthusiasm, and, and I've been doing this for a long time too, and I think there are a lot of us out there who are enthusiastic pioneers, but that's not sustainable, right? So to make it sustainable, you need more support also from above. You're muted. Thank you, Sarah. Nona, what is your view? Oh, yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Philip, and all the, the 10 consortium universities, uh, which are part of the LIST project, and congrats for the work done for since 2017. I was at the beginning of this project as Director of International Affairs Office at the Federal University of Pernambuco. I'm also um, from the same university as Roberto. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy, you know, with the results that we see. Me and Sara, we, we've been working with um, uh, virtual exchange for, for some time and, and we see all the elements uh, which can feature uh, everything that you have done as a virtual exchange, which is different from virtual mobility. And that's why, uh, why it's important because it's not something that is virtual, it's something different, uh, which make a uh, connection between people, people and faculties and, uh, and um, how can you connect it, this to the international strategy of each university. That's the point that you are asking us to do. What is the next step? Something has been done. So how can we go forward uh, with this. I think that uh, from my experience as implementing uh, BRAVE, BRAVE is as the Brazilian virtual exchange uh, initiative that um, we coined in 2018 in one of the IVEX um, um, web, not webinar, but um, conference in Chicago, uh, which means Brazilian virtual exchange, but uh, in fact it means to be BRAVE. You know, it's to be, it's to do something different and, uh, and, and to be ready to face all the good and bad, bad challenges that is embedded in such an initiative. And then I think from my experience that uh, the first thing that we have to do is, is, is to connect this initiative with the internationalization strategy of your institution. It has to be connected with this, to be uh, more open to other experience, to provide uh, capacity building to other teachers in another issues, to be um, interdisciplinar and multidisciplinar. So how can you spread better? You, you need to have support from the central um, head of your institution. So, and. And one of the ways of doing this is through an internationalization at home strategy. If it's an NVA or virtual exchange or IVC, as you call it, uh, is a strong component, maybe a strong component of this strategy. So, so it needs to be in the mission of the institution. Internationalization need, need to be a, a very powerful purpose and uh, NVA or IVC should be part of this purpose and uh, uh, it should be, we need to know and to knowledge the scope of uh, IVC or VE and we need to work in networks. It's not all among this, but to be broader, you know, there is a huge and beautiful community working with this, believe me. We just have, uh, we just finalized it in 15 years ago, days ago, our conference is the IVAC 
conference on virtual exchange. And it's amazing how many people are involved with, with such initiatives. So, so we need to work in networks and work in collaboration. And because it has a huge potential of uh, changing pedagogy as were, already was mentioned by some of our friends. And, and also the power to change the educational environment, I think. Um, and it's very powerful in the way uh, it may improve the agenda of access and equity in higher education. Because as you know, uh, at least the case of Brazil, only 2% of our students has the chance to be abroad or study abroad or have an international experience abroad uh, for many reasons. So what opportunity do you offer to the 98% of other students in terms of intercultural exchange, in terms of international experience, in terms of uh, collaboration, in terms of language. Uh, so what do you offer for the majority of your students? And IVC and VA is one opportunity. So, so there is a, a brave space, as was mentioned by uh, one of our colleagues in our conference. There is a brave space for innovation in IVC and VA. And, uh, but it needs to be connected to, to, to be embedded in the international strategy of your institution for you to have support uh, to, to develop the activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think, as you say, there's a lot of movement in the field, not just listed as a lot of projects. And the IVEC conference is an example of how much movement and momentum there's at the moment. Therefore, I'm going to pass on the question to Elmer from Groningen, maybe from the perspective of university leadership. How can we integrate virtual exchange activities better in the curriculum? Yeah, thank you, Philip, and uh, good morning, Latin America, and good afternoon, uh, Europe. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on the, on the list of projects. It's really uh, nice to see what you have achieved. And uh, I think we as University of Groningen are, are happy that we can contribute to the project. Uh, so coming back to your question, um, uh, I, I, I really agree with the previous speakers, Leonora and Sara. I think, first of all, you need some kind of commitment by university leadership that uh, internationalization is really key to the institution and that the, the leadership is willing to uh, improve on internationalization. And then maybe a very practical experience I would like to share with you uh, from my past experience as director of the University of Groningen. Um, uh, changing a university is a bit complicated, um, as we all know. So the process, how to do it, is really essential. And of course, uh, the, the way I tried to do it in the past 10 years or so is simply by seduction. So you have to seduce people to go along with the new project, maybe to give them some seed money and to finance some projects, some pilot projects and then hope that the others get jealous. So that's a really practical point of view, how to change uh, an educational system within a university. And I think with the virtual exchange, you have great options because it's so uh, tempting to, to get involved in. So uh, let me leave it at that, and thank you. I think that's a good point, sort of how do universities need to change or maybe how do they need to innovate um, to deal with this new virtual reality that we live in by necessity and that maybe also need to get better. So giving the, the word back to, uh, to Nona and Sara, how do universities need to innovate to become better at this? I'll, I'll just say that one thing that I wanted to say when Nona had finished is that um, as someone who's been in the field a long time, one of my fears actually is that there has been increased interest in virtual exchange given the COVID situation. And so my greatest fear is that um, if and when things change and they somehow go back to a certain degree to the way they were, that that interest will then disappear again. And the point I think all three of us would make, and I'm sure you would agree, Philip, is that virtual exchange was never intended to be a substitute for physical mobility, right? It is to reach the 98% that Nona was talking about. And so I, I think, and, and the other thing I would say is in terms of, Nona was talking about strategy. 
university, there are different levels of university strategies, right? And, and some have social missions and some talk about inclusion and equity in these sorts of things. And virtual exchange um, offers an opportunity to meet um, those different aspects of a university's mission or strategy. And so to, to try and um, uh, continue convincing people that the point of this is to give as many people access to an in international experience as possible. And then um, I like the idea of seduction, <laughs> um, but I also think um, there needs to be recognition. Uh, and I think all the teachers who spoke earlier would agree uh, about the amount of work that goes into this, that there's a lot of work. So recognition, either be it financial or in terms of you know, career progression, some kind of recognition of the effort they've put into this. Um, I think having student testimonials really does make a difference um, in terms of convincing teachers. And, and um, I would just like, I would just end by saying that I don't think that it that virtual exchange is necessarily new and innovative it's been around for a while what's new and innovative is the boom in the field and this growing community and so i think one of our main missions as a community moving forward is how do we grow this community how do we allow the people doing ivc and the people doing or lister project people doing nice project when i put in the chat and people doing other projects to come together and share knowledge and share experience because um, I think we could all support one another much more effectively if we find the right way to become a really strong community. Thank you, Nona? Yeah. I agree with Sara. Um, uh, we can see very recently that, uh, I mean, that um, virtual mobility can be a panacea today, you know, can be everything uh, especially in during COVID time. What we are talking about is not something that is emergency measure, you know, just to, to promote uh, from physical uh, mobility to or physical classroom to a virtual classroom. It's not the, it's not the thing that you're talking about. It's not the thing that you're, you're talking about something that, uh, that change the way we work change the idea of the classroom that we have that's probably the same for more than a hundred years uh, and how can we use technology or digital this digital space mm -hmm. to promote collaboration to promote integration to promote a uh, share of knowledge to promote diversity and interculturality inside the classroom it's not only for students, it's also for the, the faculties as well. It's also for the whole landscape of the university as a whole, you know. Um, and I think that um, what is it's the innovation is, is, I think that's because it's a brave space. The innovation, everything that's new, so moves you from your comfort zone to something that uh, sometimes you don't know where you're going to but uh, you may have some purpose to do such a journey, let's say that. So for me, one of the aspects of it is, is the pedagogical, which is involved or which is embedded in the concept of, of a virtual exchange, which is different from virtual mobility from my point of view. So uh, it's in the way that we connected people uh, and engage to work collaboratively. We just uh, saw so many uh, testimonies of how it has to be planned because we are from different institutions, from different countries, from different cultures, from different legal backgrounds that uh, organize our activities or recognize our activities. So how can put everything together? How can put students to talk to each another and to be in the same classroom and work collaboratively. All of these things for me is in the brave space. It's, it brings innovation into the classroom. And I think that there is one more aspect that I think that for me is the most important uh, on, on such initiatives that uh, we need to speak to a much needed social justice uh, agenda in higher education institution around the world is to give opportunity to the other 98% of students 
um, to have a, a different and a more diverse and a more multicultural experience and international experience without leaving your country, you know, connecting all the, all the issues from your local experience, but with your wires to the global, to the global scene. So how can we make the con these connections and provide this space for, for uh, the university as a whole, you know, for students and for faculties and, and for, you know, for members of the universities. That, that's for me is the space, is the brave mm -hmm. space of innovation, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. I have one more quick question for each of one of you. Um, for the audience, if you have a specific question for our panel, you can ask it now and I will bring it up if it's something very specific that is connected to the topic of the panel. My last question is maybe going a bit back more to the teachers and the classroom uh, perspective. Uh, what do you think are the next steps to develop virtual teaching further? What are the trends and uh, the next steps that uh, are happening right now or need to happen in the, in the years to come? Let's start with Elma and then we go backwards. Yes, thank you, Philip. Um, um, I, I think the, there are basically two trends, I think, in, in higher education where uh, virtual exchange really can, can contribute to or benefit from. And the first one is, uh, I think, the um, strong conviction that active learning and personalization of learning is really growing. And I think we have a lot of examples around us that really show that activation uh, of students and, and learning is really beneficial to, uh, let's say, the results that students achieve and also to the pleasure that students enjoy in, in their programs. So that's, that would be my first uh, item. The second item is that I, there's also a trend of uh, offering smaller programs and bundling education and also their virtual uh, exchange and contributions can really can really be helpful. Um, that's the world of uh, what we call micro-credentials and, and student badges. And I think that's uh, a field that is still relatively unexplored, that in Europe plays a large role in uh, university politics. So that's really a, a, a showcase, I think, where this field can contribute to. Thank you. Nona? Um, we could ask what is the road of success so that we can follow some steps. Um, and I would say that there is no single recipe. There is no single answer, but there are some things, some elements that we have to have um, at least to, to follow some steps that could uh, uh, scaling up the initiative um, in, in, in the universities. The first one is, as I said, work aligned with the international policy and strategy of your institution. Um, have the support of your leader, as Elmer uh, mentioned before, uh, either rectors or pro-rectors, or you know, have the key st stakeholders together willing to support these initiatives. Um, the other one is related to the process itself. Uh, to start small, is what I'm, what I can say, start small, and scale it up uh, gradually and incrementally. So we, we have this experience at the Federal University of Pernambuco with the brave initiatives we offer today. Twenty three disciplines uh, with the what we call the brave mm -hmm. component, and everything is inside our syllabus and into the curriculum of the students. So we provided the whole process from the pilot to the, let's say, legal aspects of recognition of such uh, elements into the curriculum of the students. So we start small and scale it up gradually and incrementally and make it accessible to our students. We could say that uh, maybe we have a problem with languages, languages will not be a problem. At the beginning, we thought of this. Oh, you, because we offer in English, we speak Portuguese. So how can you, 50% uh, of the placements in our university is for low-income people, for low-income families. 
So with the level of linguists uh, very low, so how can we provide them with the same experience? And, and language is not a huge barrier as we, we thought it would be. So we need to have a coordination of everything. So we need to have a, to, a coordination to follow all, to support all, all the teachers, to support the students, to support with technology. Just, it's not huge technology. You know, is everything that we're using, smartphone, tablets, you know, a good Wi-Fi and internet. Um, we need some money, as Elmer mentioned before, because uh, IVC or V is not free. It's not free. So we need, we need some money that should have some sort of support uh, to, to the teachers who decided to be engaged with such an activities. We need to need to have some basic infrastructures enough enough so to coordinate it as Sarah mentioned. So it's go to your director of international affairs office, you know, because they need to coordinate everything. And I think that it, it, as as was mentioned in the presentation before, train, train, train. You, you have to train, train, train. Uh, so the capacity building is a process that never ends for me, so that it, we have all the time to be uh, into the process always. So connect, connection and network is also part of it. You have to spread your experience and to make more connections to it and keep it simple at the beginning. Otherwise, we will not move uh, far away from that. Okay, the final word will belong to Sarah. And I would like to direct one question from the audience, maybe to you, Sarah, for your answering. Nigel is answering, uh, asking that we're getting all those emails from companies who are trying That's to sell us to start. <laughs> uh, how to sell us equipment, how to assess what, what one actually needs in terms of equipment. Maybe that is your, your next step question. Well, he, it, wait, so I read it as um, to improve my work in virtual teaching. Um, so I think um, my first reaction was, ah, in the sense that um, I think one of the, if I have to be honest, one of the sad things about COVID in terms of online teaching is that it, it forced a whole bunch of people to go teach online who had no experience with teaching online. And teaching online is not the same as teaching in person and virtual exchange is not the same as teaching online, right? So um, virtual exchange and your IVC being what it's the collaborative teamwork and the people to people interaction, that's where the key is. Um, so actually one of the points I was going to make, and this relates back to the sense of community is that I think one of the steps moving forward is find people who are experts in virtual exchange and, and get advice from them. <laughs> These edutech companies, I would say most of the time are interested in, um, in, getting you to do things the way they've always done them. Whereas virtual exchange is doing things in a different way. And it's more about pedagogy than it is the technology. And I think that also came out in, in the way all of your colleagues presented what you experienced in Listo that yes, the technology is there, but okay, it was what's that this time. It might be something else in the future. What's important is that there was a tool that students could easily use to communicate in an asynchronous and synchronous format. So, it's not about the tool, it's how do we want them to communicate and to what purpose to collaboratively, effectively work collaboratively. Um, so I think um, tapping into the community and finding people with, who have experience in, in this kind of work. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out um, is that one of the points of resistance, I think from some teachers is that this might not fit into, um, and this happens more specifically in certain types of universities, but it might not fit into their research agenda that, you know, they think they, they have to publish to, to, you know, progress in their career. Whereas there actually is a lot of work, a lot of research to be done into virtual exchange. So I think people need to, to recognize that. And, you know, we, our unit collaboration started the journal of virtual exchange, and we hope that that will help grow the field because it is also a field of research and has been for, you know, over two decades now. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say in terms of steps moving forward is visibility and visibility both for teachers and for students. So I don't know, for example, with the students who did your Listo project on their uh, official transcripts, does this appear as an international intercultural experience or not? 
Um, and, and so I think in that case, each university or at least each you know, country might have their own solution to that. But it need, just as a study abroad experience is visible on a student's transcript, any experience they have like this needs to be visible as well. So that it, it, it's giving um, students something they can take to future employers and say, look, I have learned to work in global virtual teams. I can do this. And this is what you're going to want and need me to do here. I've done it and I did it successfully. So um, those are uh, anything else I wanted to say. Uh, and just that I, I agree with Nona that I think it's really important. Like you had that list on your website with the, the people to reach out to at the different universities. I think moving forward, if you want to establish this type of activity in your institution, there needs to be the one person point of contact for virtual exchange or IVC who teachers or technicians or students or partners can all reach out to. So, so that, that, those are my last two cents. Great, very good point about the research. This is something that our list of teachers are also working on. So they're preparing a couple of pages, papers that analyze this teaching experience also. Thank you very much to the three of you. This was great to lift up the topic and come out of the whole of a virtual classroom and look at the bigger picture a little bit. Thank you very much for joining me. We will come now to the conclusion of the webinar. I will just show you how we can stay in touch with each other. Philip, can I, can I just mention one thing? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's out of a... <laughs> briefly. Oh, uh, yes, very briefly. Um, in the IVAC, um, one of the speakers mm -hmm. mentioned that uh, people who were involved with IVC or VE, uh, the VE practitioners uh, are on the pirate, pirate ship, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody on the education sector represents the Navy. So in, in Commons, she said, um, uh, internationalization at home through VA, let's keep some of that spirit of those who choose the pirate ship over the Navy. So this is the spirit we mm -hmm. need to have VA work or IVC work to contribute to less changing in perspectives. So um, that's, that's the final word that I would li like to say is that um, uh, we are not alone. Uh, there is a beautiful community out there that's really interesting to engage with. And um, it's give, if it gives you or oh, give us energy, then go for it, try it, because it can be very powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can all live with that pirate imagery at the end. And this is something that a lot of my colleagues can probably relate to. Um, if you would like to find out more about Listo, this is our website. Uh, you can follow up on us and you can follow us also on Instagram and on Twitter. And this was webinar number two in a series of three. Next week, uh, we have uh, another one that is dedicated to the topic of entrepreneurial university. What does that mean? How can you strengthen this? And we will develop an approach developed by the Lister Consortium to analyze that and uh, to support the entrepreneurial spirit of a university. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you very much to the whole Lister crew and family. Uh, this has been an amazing experience to develop this IVC bottom up and um, I'm very confident that we will continue in the future. Thanks for joining today, and I hope to see you again next week, next Wednesday, same time and place. Thanks and bye-bye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you very much.